And Congresswoman and 2020 candidate Tulsi Gabbard is criticizing competitor Senator Kamala Harris over her comments about Joe Biden. In last month's debate, Harris criticized the former vice president for his remarks about working with segregationist senators. Gabbard joined Red and Blue yesterday, and my colleague Tanya Rivero asked her about her thoughts on the Harris-Biden exchange. I want to ask you about your campaign Twitter account, which today commented on the Biden-Harris fallout after their exchange on busing during the most recent debates. Now, you said that Harris leveled a, quote, false accusation that Joe Biden is racist. Can you tell us exactly what your issue is with how the senator is handling this? Uh, well, exactly what I said there. Uh, levying this this accusation uh, that Joe Biden is racist when he's clearly not as a way to try to uh, smear him. And as you point to the article that I linked to in my tweet, really what she's saying is her position is the same one that she was criticizing Joe Biden for. So uh, this is just a political ploy uh, and I think a very underhanded one just to try to get her self-attention, to move herself up in the polls. I think, I think that we need to be above that, all of us. And Biden has also said that he would rather talk about the future instead of talking about the past. And some perhaps might wonder if the party is focusing a little too much on the issue of race um, at the expense of some other issues. Would you share that concern? Uh, no, I think there are still racial injustices and inequalities that exist in this country that we need to address. I think it's important for us to look forward towards the future to see how we can come together as a country, how we can break down these injustices and inequalities and come together and work towards a brighter future. Every single candidate will need to stand up and uh, speak out, defend their own record. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is how we can bring about this vision to ensure that we truly do have equality and justice and opportunity for every single American. So now CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe joins me from Washington to talk about uh, all the latest news coming out of the 2020 race. But we're going to start with what we heard from uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard, her, her comments on Senator Harris. I got to say, I never expected that in 2019, the, the busing would be a 2019 campaign issue. But it's certainly that interaction with them during the debate stirred that up and people started asking that question. I'm wondering how other candidates are dealing with the back and forth between Biden and Harris. Well, they're mostly spectators, Anne-Marie, but we should clarify one thing that the congresswoman said there. She claims that Senator Harris is calling the former vice president racist. Mm. If you were watching the debate, if you've watched the exchange between them, you remember that the senator made very clear, I don't think you're racist, she said to Biden. And so for Gabbard to say that Harris is doing this as a political ploy, well, that may be the case, but one could argue that perhaps the congresswoman is doing that too by inserting herself into a conversation that she wasn't involved in <laughs> and accusing Harris of something that she very clearly said Biden was not, mm -hmm. which is he, she said he is not you know, not racist. They just have this disagreement, or it, everyone thought they had a disagreement at the time over busing, when in reality, they don't, because Harris essentially holds the same position as Biden, which is that it's one of many tools and maybe not the best one that has to be used at this point in time. So uh, an interesting thing, and, it, and I agree with you, Anne-Marie, it's a little perplexing that this issue, more than so many others, for some reason, has dominated the discourse over the last 10 days or so. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so let's talk about the the uh, most recent news that we just got moments ago. Uh, yeah. We learned that Amy McGrath will be running against Mitch McConnell for his Senate seat. Um, you know, is he vulnerable? I don't know. Uh, not necessarily, but if there was any Democrat who could probably mount a well-funded challenge to McConnell in the coming year, it's Amy McGrath. Remember, she was a, one of those star recruits for Democrats last year during the midterm elections to run in seats that suddenly became competitive because of their compelling life stories and the fact that they were willing to put their careers on the line and run for Congress. She lost in a district that is one of the more volatile ones, at least politically in Kentucky, one that's gone back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. And she raised millions of dollars in the process and established a bit of a national profile. So it's no surprise that she now emerges as McConnell's likely opponent. The last time he ran, he ran against the Secretary of State in Kentucky, who also drew a lot of national attention from Democrats 
Uh, and as you pointed out, he won by 200,000 votes. We'll see about McGrath. I think this is a slightly different character. Uh, the introduction video that she released this morning is similar to the one that she released last year. People may remember her. She's a Marine uh, Navy pilot, uh, had talked about the fact that as a young girl, she was told by all sorts of people, including people like Mitch McConnell, that women couldn't fly in combat. Uh, what she did in this introductory video this morning is point out that she had written a letter to Mitch McConnell saying she disagreed with the policy, never heard back from him, and found other Kentuckians who through the years have reached out to him and been ignored. And it sounds like that'll be a big part of her, of her argument against the Senate Majority Leader, that he's someone who perhaps at this time isn't best equipped to represent the bluegrass state. All right. Should be an interesting race then. We'll see. Yeah. Um, so then we have another possible announcement coming today. Billionaire Tom Steyer is expected to make an announcement about his candidacy. I have to admit, when I heard this yesterday, I sort of had to sort of go back in time because I, re I remember, I, I actually thought, didn't he already say he was running? I couldn't really remember. He had this massive campaign about impeaching the president. He spent an awful lot of money on slick commercials on the cable yeah. channels. Um, so what's going on with him? You know, what's changed? Well, first off, Steyer is an environmental activist, big Democratic Party donor from the San Francisco area, who for years, given his wealth and ambition, has been seen as somebody who could run for something. There was thought he might run for the Senate seat in California or in the governor's race in California. Well, both of those positions are filled, and so everyone thought, well, maybe he'll run for president. And he flirted with it earlier this year, but made clear in late January he wouldn't do it and would focus instead on this group that he's established called Need to Impeach trying to push, especially House Democrats, to embrace the idea of launching an impeachment inquiry against the president and threatening to potentially spend money against Democrats who stood in the way of doing that. For whatever reason, and it hasn't yet been explained to us, he's now decided that instead of just focusing on that, he needs to run for president. We'll see what kind of an impact he can have. He's a 65-year-old billionaire. There have been a few other guys like that who've taken a pass on the race, understanding that perhaps that kind of experience isn't what Democrats are looking for. But it's likely, given the work he's done in the past year, that he'll focus especially on this concept of impeaching President Trump. And, you know, with the way the uh, party has sort of organized the debate schedule, right. he's not going to be able to just finance his entire campaign all on his own and still make it on that debate stage. Uh, speaking of that, we're now finding out that uh, we've got a candidate who's uh, dropping out. Swalwell is going to be dropping out. He's the first candidate. He doesn't think he's going to qualify for the next uh, debate later on this month. Um, can we see maybe more candidates dropping out before we ha before we head to Detroit for the debates? It's, it's likely that we'll see them drop out after Detroit. Mm. Eric Swalwell, the 38-year-old congressman, also from the Bay Area of California, dropped out yesterday because he thought that he might struggle to get into that next debate. He admitted that he only raised about $850,000 from 21,000 donors in the past quarter. There are other candidates uh, also uh, dwelling at the bottom of the rankings who have likely crept ahead of him, among them the Montana governor, Steve Bullock, who also got into this contest late. And the thought was that Bullock is likely going to take that 20th spot from someone like Swalwell. This matters this time, remember, as you said, because the DNC has established rules that require you to ra raise a certain amount of money from a certain number of people or hit certain thresholds in polling in order to qualify for the debates. And if you're not in the debates, you basically have no real ability to, to find oxygen and build a campaign. So it's after the July debate at the end of the month in Detroit where we think some of these contenders in this uh, Hollywood Squares box of ours, are likely to suddenly disappear because the threshold gets higher for the debate in September mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be held by ABC and Univision, where you have to be raising money for more people and you have to hit a certain polling threshold, about 2%. That sounds easy. It's been very difficult for about a dozen of the people running for president. Mm -hmm. And while all of us are watching these debates and watching these candidates, they're really trying to woo the primary voters, yep. uh, at least on, at this first stage. So now we're hearing some really interesting news coming out of Iowa and Nevada. The caucus is there. They're going to change the way the voting is conducted. What can you tell me about that? And what do you think sort of the implications will be? Well, yeah, they're changing it in such a way that you can use your phone to cast a ballot in the Iowa and Nevada caucuses. Remember, a caucus is different than a primary. Primary, you can vote all day long from like 7 a.m. in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. Caucuses in Iowa and Nevada are held at specific times, and you have to be there the entire time. In Iowa, it's usually at night. In Nevada, because they hold them on Saturdays, it might be in the afternoon. Well, disabled people, uh, people who have to work, uh, older people who can't get out of the house, 
are often barred from participating in, in these events. And there's been complaints from Democratic campaigns through the years that they create a sense of exclusivity and, and not inclusivity. And so Nevada and Iowa now are going to create an option for people to call in and essentially pick their first, second, and third choices for president. And those numbers will be used uh, in conjunction with the in person caucusing and we'll see how it goes. It has the potential to be a real nightmare logistically. There are concerns about the security of this. There's concerns that, you know, people who cast ballots, by the time they're counted, their candidate may not be in the mix anymore. We're going to be covering this, obviously, over the next few months. But it's a sign that voting in this country has the potential to change the way we do it, that maybe you don't have to show up in person at some point. Maybe you'll be able to cast your ballot by phone or by email. This has been talked about for years, and we'll see how Nevada and Iowa do with it yeah, early next you know, year. I, yeah, I guess this will be sort of a, t uh, a test case. Um, totally. Certainly, I've wondered for a long time why we haven't kind of gone that way, but then when you see all these security breaches and leaks and so on and so forth of, of databases, you can see it could be ripe with uh, problems as well. Ed, thank you very much. Take care, Anne-Marie.